So um, now we uh, should uh, transfer to the uh, another next talk. Next talk is given by Professor Christopher Wolf. Wolf, uh, Wolf is a professor of anthropology and education at the Free University of Berlin. And he is also the vice president of German Commission of UNESCO. Meanwhile, he's also visiting professors and honorable professors in many other universities like Stanford, Los, uh, Los Angeles, New York, and also for, uh, in China for sure. He is also the co-founder of the Commission on Pedagogic Anthropology of the German Educational Research Association and being a member of the Interdisciplinary Center of History Anthropology and the Cluster of Excellence, Excellence Language of Emotion, and so on. His research is relatively broad, ranged from historic anthropology, uh, studies in ritual and gestures in school field, mimetic learning, imagination, and emotions. Today, we, uh, he will talk about uh, the um, uh, embodiment through mimetic learning, a perspective for the future um, education. So to elaborate how body my matters for our future education and how this mimetic learning were different from the other kind of uh, cognitive learning. After Professor Wolf's talk, I will give a very short discussions and dialogues with Professor Wolf. So have Wolf, please continue. And Professor Bignant, please uh, withdraw your, uh, close your uh, slides. Thank you. Uh, so maybe <laughs> she's not here. Uh, have Wolf, you should unmute your. Uh, you should unmute. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 No, it's uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Bigman, please close your slides. Or. Is she still here? <laughs> uh, she forgot to uh, close this slide. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So have Wolf, please continue. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, ni hao ma. <laughs> here in, in Berlin, it's morning. It's very cold, but a beautiful day with sunshine and a very pleasant atmosphere. But as I said, quite cold. Anyway, I just wanted to start or to say that I highly appreciate what Osta Birkeland was saying about education. I go completely with her, the importance of cultural education, of aesthetics. You know, I've been uh, working together with Elliot Eisner, a very well-known American um, art educator in Stanford for many, many decades, you could even say. And... Um, so we developed this kind of approach, which is more complex than what you uh, encounter when you talk about PISA and uh, evidence-based education. And I fully agree also with the complexity of education uh, we have to face in order to um, educate our children for the, in, for the uh, expected future. Okay, having said that, I want to see say that I start with the assumption that we live in the Anthropocene. That means in a period where the human being determines very much the destiny of the planet. And I have been talking on this uh, during the last uh, months here in, in um, uh, Shanghai. And I, the point is that we are expecting very basic changes uh, in our educational system. And we have to uh, do these, realize these changes. And um, I think uh, what is at, at stake now is this kind of transformation. And um, that means that we need a much more complex understanding of what the human being is like and what education is like and what children are like. And that is why I think that education anthropology is kind of important. Today, I would like to talk about the concept of mimesis, mimetic learning as uh, the important uh, tool for the embodiment of culture. Uh, what does that mean? 
First of all, um, I would like to make clear that um, uh, the human being is uh, in, a, in a period where certain values like growth or perfection and progress are no longer that valuable than they used to be uh, 20 years ago. We are now much more aware of the negative outsides of uh, uh, our action and ma mainly the actions of the people in the northern parts of the um, hemisphere. You could even say uh, the Western culture. You know, the idea of modernization has really uh, created lots of problems which we are facing now related to climate, to uh, biodiversity and so on and so on. And also to the, to the destruction of non-renewable uh, resources and so on. And uh, this actually asks for a new conceptualization of education. And my thesis is that mimetic learning is an approach to this. Uh, we need new models and new ways of uh, teaching children and uh, learning of children. And in, in order to develop these, and uh, Asla has done something along these lines, it is very important to reconsider what um, evaluation is or, and, or what, and what uh, uh, mimetic learning is. And that is, you know, usually you think that mimetic learning doesn't pay. It's just, uh, you know, repeating things and copying it um, and, and so on. And so you devaluate this point. And in my view, mimetic learning is basic. It's the basic learning of the human being. And you have not to reduce it to a copy machine. This is a wrong understanding of mimetic learning. In my view, mimetic learning is a basis for creative learning and it's part of creative learning. And I would like to explain this in the course of my, my talk. So um, my, the, the starting point is the idea that uh, we as human beings are not determined by instinct the same way as other primates or other uh, animals. We are, have a certain kind of openness towards the world and we can make, take decisions. We can say yes and no. For example, when I'm very hungry and you offer me a, a steak, I still can say no, whereas a dog, for example, cannot say no. The instincts are much, much uh, more uh, de developed and much uh, stronger in, in the case of animals. So in human beings, it's this kind of saying no which is the, the uh, point of freedom, where we have a choice of what we can do. And in the project you are doing here, con uh, relating to the future of education, I think this is the basis, and this is extremely important. So my, my point is that I think that one of the most basic um, ways of learning is related to a creative imitation, what I call mimesis, relating this to the Greek um, um, uh, concept. Already Aristotle made very clear, saying, well, you know, the human being is the most mimetic being in the world. And it's, uh, we live because we have to adapt culture through mimetic processes. Our new generations have to repeat the development of uh, humanity in a few years. And this is related to the possibilities of, of mimetic behavior, of imitating, but not in the sense of copying. It's a creative imitation. It is that everybody uh, does his own thing in, in uh, behaving mimetically. For example, you know, we have all different biological backgrounds. We have all different cultural backgrounds. And uh, so we are very individual. We are, nobody is like the other, if you look at it in, a, in a, a precise way. And having this, having said this, you can also see that mimetic processes are very much uh, individual processes, very different from person to person. But what is the uh, important point? The important point is, as Aristotle said, that human beings have to learn culture in order to be able to live. You know, whereas 
in other in case of other primates, the instinct um, determine very much what they do. We have to produce culture and we have to to transmit culture to the new generation. And that means uh, that we we are completely depending on a creative imitation. That is, in my view, the center of, of, of education. When I say this, uh, then, of course, it is also um, um, important to see that this implies a very complex way of, of uh, understanding the human being and the, and the, the children. It is uh, not only cognitive knowledge, which is mainly um, stressed in, in, in tests, um, but it is the Bildung, as uh, Asta uh, Birkeland said it earlier, is the Bildung, the education in a more complex way, which implies, for example, social behavior, which implies the um, ability to, to, uh, uh, to handle emotions, the ability to be sensitive, use its senses in life and to fulfill to live a uh, fulfilled life, this is very much needed. It doesn't make sense to reduce uh, life to the complexity, to the simplicity of tests. I'm not talking completely against tests, but I'm trying to make clear where the limits are. And I think it is a big problem in, also in the international system that there is an overestimation of uh, testing and also of uh, uh, evidence-based uh, learning. My experience is, is that this is a wonderful approach to diagnose uh, problems. And this is happening and has happened, but it is not an approach which helps to change things. For changing, you need a completely different competence. You need, and I think uh, Asta gave, gave wonderful examples how you can change uh, education. Okay, having said that, I work on the assumption that um, mimetic learning is the central learning uh, of culture, of human beings, and that human beings are, as already Aristotle said, are highly talented to learn in a uh, mimetic way. This, the importance of this mimetic learning has been also discovered now in evolutionary uh, anthropology. Um, people like Tomasello, for example, they made very clear in research how the young child of eight months is already able to understand situations which a, a, a primate, another non-human primate, never will understand. There is an, another ability in, in human beings. Uh, and he also makes very clear that uh, in, already in the first few months, the human being develops through mimetic processes. Um, that is one approach. The other very important approach which supports my thesis is are the neurosciences. They have done complex uh, research, finding out that uh, uh, the, there are, there's a mirror neuron system. What does that mean? It means that when I see a behavior, uh, let's say somebody beats somebody, and I see it, then is a, a process in my brain uh, is takes place which makes me understand what is happening because I repeat the beating and the suffering of the other person mimetically, and that is the power of of uh, of mimesis that it uh, actually is the tool to integrate the world and to understand the world. I will explain that more in details. But the neurosciences have proven this very, very well that, that the uh, uh, neuro uh, mirror system is essential um, for, for learning and for understanding the world. So having said that, that is the, um, also in, in my uh, uh, talk here, the third point, the mirror neurons. The uh, fourth point is anthropological approaches. So my thesis is that mimetic processes take place because they are related to the human being, to the and uh, anthropological research shows that in all cultures, we have these mimetic processes. This is a very general term, 
and a very universal term for human beings. But the way it happens is very different. You know, you have uh, cultures where uh, learning is understood as almost copying things uh, and certain parts of learning uh, are understood this way. And you have other cultures where the creative elements in the mimetic process is stressed because, um, you know, we, uh, we are all different and therefore we also uh, have different mimetic processes with, which we realize. And, and this is very much uh, the case. And what my interest is to re discover the importance of, of a creative mimetic learning, also in order to cope with the new challenges uh, related to the Anthropocene, related to the uh, uh, goal number four uh, of the sustainable development goals and so on and so on. And that implies, of course, uh, a certain historical understanding of, of uh, uh, mim mimetic processes and of uh, we have to relate it to our situation and we have to create new models of behavior less violent towards nature less violent towards other people less violent towards ourselves and this is a, a, a very important value in education this is not you it's very difficult to test this but still it is makes a human being a human being uh, that these values related to human rights and to other uh, ways of, uh, of, of, of social behavior. So the argument is uh, that we, uh, that also anthropologically speaking, we, we have to uh, pay more attention to these uh, uh, mimetic processes. <laughs> My next point is uh, as a, uh, the mimesis as a concept of historical anthropology that focuses again very much the um, historical uh, character of learning, the historical character of uh, mimetic processes, and also the um, cultural uh, processes uh, which are related to the mimetic um, attitude. Let me give you an example. The historical dimension helps us to understand um, in a diachronic uh, way, that I, looking in, in the past, who we are, what the challenges of our time are, and the comparison with other cultures, the same in our uh, same time, help us to find out what is specific about Chinese, China, about Europe, uh, uh, about Latin America, about Africa and even more particular uh, about uh, very uh, local uh, approaches to education. So this is a, a, a important because it also confronts us with the fact that uh, things are not so sure as it's often suggested by uh, quantitative empirical research. First of all, the research can be discussed uh, considerably, and I did that some weeks ago in a short contribution here in this context, um, you know, you can con discuss it and, uh, and find out that there are also limits of knowledge and that you have many assumptions when you think that the number, the figures determine uh, the value of, of, of learning. And uh, you can, of course, have other approaches that relates to your values, to your anthropological understanding of what a child is like. Uh, and then you come up with other ways of, of education. And it seems to me that when you want to educate for the future, you have to help children to be creative. And to be creative, that means they have to relate to the existing world, but then develop in this relationship their own view on the world and in, and in, a, in a creative way. Okay, that is um, so, so far the, the point. When I talk about creative Im imagination, what do I mean? That is point six here in you. Uh, I mean the possibility to see that the world is realized in one way, but it could be different too. So it is the, uh, the, the idea that there are always alternatives, always possibilities. And I think a good education has to make people, children sen sensitive that there is not only one way 
of solving problems. That may be the case in some, some areas of mathematics, but generally in the social problem and cultural affairs, there are many, many ways. And to understand uh, that uh, this is what, what is uh, uh, actually providing a fulfilled life for children, uh, that is one aspect. You know, we are not allowed to, to sacrifice the value of, of childhood uh, to some economical goals of growth and whatever. This is the wrong way. You know, every individual is unique <laughs> and has its unique right of a fulfilled life where it has meaning and experiences that way. <laughs> so uh, the, the point is the, the creativity is the looking for alternatives and seeing alternatives to what we do. And that implies that we are open for alterity, for other people, for other cultures, for other ways of being in the world. And this is essential in, even when you, when you um, stress the importance of uh, global citizenship or um, planetary education. That means an education which takes also into consideration already at a very early age that we are uh, that we are all parts of the of a planet, and that uh, human beings have a certain common responsibility for the future of the um, planet. And I, in that sense, not only, of course, uh, this perspective. There's also a Chinese perspective. There's a very individual perspective to education. This is all true. But what is kindly kind of new is that we consider ourselves also as parts of. Uh, of uh, uh, civic, of a global citizenship. And um, in, in, in summer, we will have a, a, a conference with Peking University and uh, FU and uh, HU in Berlin on these issues, uh, because they actually demand for new ways of, of education and of new forms of openness. So my, if I get to the next point, Mimesis and performativity, what does that mean? The, my assumption is that in mimetic learning, you learn not only a, a cognitive concept, you learn with the, your, your whole body. It is with your senses, with your emotions. And performativity means the way and how education is organized. What's the mise-en-scene of education? And you know, there are lots of difference. You can have a, a class, 60 students and a teacher, and uh, the teacher teaches the children. You can have group works uh, that you make uh, maybe 15 groups out of the 60 children and try to get bring this together and so on. There are lots of ways we can uh, teach and arrange it. But important is that it's the, the performance of the body. It is not just of an intellectual brain. No, we are always and you we have seen that in the in the uh, co uh, corona crisis you know children suffered because they couldn't go to school and couldn't relate to the other uh, uh, students they were alone and lonely very often and i think one of the consequences of this is also that people now know much more how important this body learning is this which which relates to other people and the mise en scène of the uh, of the learning. Okay, then next point is aesthetic experience. What I have said makes very clear that in my view, the mimetic approach is central for aesthetic learning or for cultural learning. What does that mean? For example, when you read a novel, what do you do? You recreate exactly what the, the uh, author of the novel has written. And you recreate it in yourself and in your imaginary. And this is what, this is a mimetic process. Famous truth, if you listen to music, you, by listening, you recreate what has been uh, uh, played. And by recreating, you enlarge your own um, imaginary, your own uh, way of being in the world. So my argument is that in order to take the outside world into the inside world, it needs mimetic processes. In mimetic processes, we take an imprint 
from something, in this case, the novel or the piece of music, and integrate it in our imaginary, in our own world. And there we have a certain freedom, how we do it and what we do with it and, and how uh, it comes back when, when we have forgotten it and so on and so on. But in any case, a deep uh, relationship to cultural products, but also to na nature, is a prerequisite for a fulfilled life and also for a, a personality, for the development of a personality. You know, you can understand copying just as a superficial process. In my understanding, mimetic learning is not superficial. It's staying with the things. It's investing time. For example, if you have a piece of art, you just stay with this piece of art. You learn the figures, the, co the um, uh, colors uh, of that piece of art as you learn a, a poetry. You can, and then you can integrate that through, a, through a, a mimetic process based on imagination into your imaginary. So we all have certain poems which, with which we live uh, our, our life, but the same is also possible for pieces of music or for pieces of, uh, 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 of literature or, or, or poetry. So uh, in that sense, uh, uh, mimetic learning is a very basic uh, way of being in the world. And the importance is this side, you know, taking a picture and recreating it in a mimetic process is more important than talking about the significance of the image. The image, the, the iconic character of an image, you get only in a mimetic process. The same is true when you listen to, uh, uh, to, <clears throat> to music or when you read a novel. It is not only important to mean what that, to uh, analyze what that means. It is important to see how things relate, how the behavior relates in a novel, how uh, people behave. That is what is particular and which can be only communicated in, in this example through, uh, through literature. So my argument is mimesis needs uh, uh, processes which are less accelerated. One of the big problems of modernity is, <clears throat> and you know very well about what I'm talking because it's the same in China as in, in Europe, uh, is the, the tremendous acceleration of everything. And this leads also to superficiality. You know, people have to stay with things, spend time, really integrate them. And this kind of behavior, integrating, having time, digesting what, what uh, you learn, this is the basis for a creative action. Uh, whereas superficial learning leads you <clears throat> to do what everybody does <laughs> and leads you to relate to, you know, to just a simple uh, uh, behavior. Whereas what I'm asking for is the exemplary study in depth of things, less but in depth. And then I think is also the chance to develop creativity. Because how do you develop creativity with children? You have to give them the chance to be creative. That means you as teacher, you have to be, you have to pull, pull back and have to uh, create situations which are open and where the children, the students can try out their own thinking. And then you have to also create the atmosphere that they dare to do it. You know that you don't uh, that mistakes are accepted. It's not nothing negative. When you look for something new, you might do mistakes. It doesn't matter. But this kind of uh, of uh, learning is is uh, important, and I call this mimetic learning because I'm always experiencing and seeing that this is re very much related to a, a, a full body based process of, of learning and not just of a uh, learning by heart, you know, in a, in a cognitive way. So um, I think this is a, a, an important point. Ne then the next point, uh, how much time do I have? Quarter of an hour still? You still have 30 minutes, so. Yeah, I have to, and how many I have? 15 more. 30, 30 minutes, 13 minutes, sorry. So it's, should, should I come to an end or what? No, no, you still have 13 minutes, so take your time. Yeah, you let me know. Huh? 
Okay. Okay. Um, so the point is, and this is a very central point, uh, that practical knowledge is created in mimetic processes. What does that mean? You know, we le all learn uh, by uh, practicing things, by doing things. This is important also, you know, since Rousseau, it's very well known. There are different ways you can uh, um, uh, teach something and students learn. You can also provide them with some activities. But the important point is that they themselves do things. And in doing it, they develop a practical knowledge. And this is very difficult to assess because this is a very complex process, which involves all the senses, which involves earlier experiences, which involves very individual ways of being in the world. <coughs> so in that sense, we, we it is needed that uh, there is space for practical knowledge and practical experiences. Uh, the point is, it is, you know, acting is very different from from just talking and from analyzing. And you need a certain way of handling things, experience, social experiences, as well as practical experiences related to the work you do. So my argument is that this is learned extremely well in mimetic processes that, you know, is known in the German uh, dual system of, of uh, professional education. You know, people show you how to do things and then you do it your own way. And depending on the task, this can be very different from what the, your, your uh, master showed you, or it can be very close to it. This is an, an open point. But the point is that we develop ourselves also on this level, that we accept that this is important in education. It's not just what you can cognitively repeat. No, it's what, you can, what influences your behavior, your being in the world. And this is what, what I call practical knowledge in the sense that you are able to create your practice and also to shape your, your practice. Um, okay, then an, another point I just want to mention, I cannot go into details here, is uh, that mimetic processes often lead also to violence. That may be astonishing. And, um, uh, the, but let me explain what I mean. When you have, for example, um, a group of youngsters and uh, they meet somebody from a minority group and then somehow some tensions come up. Then the group will always uh, get rid of the responsibility. There is a group subject which develops, which is different from the subject which each of the members of the, of the group have. And that is why often when, when you have violence among youngsters, it is a group which uh, selects somebody and as, an, as a group uh, without, um, without the individual responsibility, with, just with a group subject uh, uh, works against the uh, other person, violates it. No. Um, and that you have also in, in uh, images about, um, you know, um, other cultures and about negative things. For example, in the German history, uh, in, in the Nazi period, uh, the Jew were responsible for everything. And that was everything was mimetically thrown on, on them and they were made responsible for everything, which was completely stupid and was used to actually to get rid of the violence which you have in, the, in each society. They project the violence on, on somebody. Uh, the violence they are experiencing themselves. And you have these kind of processes a, a lot. And uh, uh, in education, it is quite important to deal with them. And even in the kindergarten, these things happen. Um, OK, uh, so having said that, I would my argument would be it is important to rediscover the importance of, of uh, mimetic learning, of creative imitation. It is important to uh, get rid of the, a narrow concept of copying, of, of imitation as copying. This is not what I, I'm after. I'm after about 
um, the, the development of a mimetic way of learning, but that means one which, uh, in which we take time, in which the whole body is involved, the senses, the emotions, um, and where we recreate the cultural uh, products we want to transfer to the children. And now relating this to our particular situation in, in the 21st century, we need new models also of an uh, ecologically uh, uh, better behavior, of a um, uh, behavior which tries to avoid the um, big um, uh, detours and the big bad developments of modernity. And in that sense, uh, I think children also can take part in the search for these new ways of behaving. This relates, for example, to consumption. I, I know this is a very delicate uh, topic, and I know also the, the pleasure young people have to buy new things and so on. I mean, you know, and I'm not arguing for an aesthetic kind of behavior, but I'm asking of a conscious uh, way of behaving. And of course, our consumption is learned mimetically, unconsciously. You know, we children do what the parents do. And uh, when we want to change this behavior, and there is no choice. I think we have to change our consumption behavior in the middle range. Um, then we have also to create new models of consumption, which are accepted, which are cool, as, as some people say today. You know. Um, and um, in that sense, uh, the mimetic learning is part also of a strategy of transition and of uh, changing the, the, the actual situation of our societies. And in that sense, I think you, they play a certain role in, in the five uh, Ps we can uh, talk about. I have, that, that is things relating to the planet. And this is the protection of the ecosystem. There, these processes play an important role. It is also important to people for the social relationship because I understand the behavior of another person only by recreating it in my brain, what is happening. And that is what the neuroscience uh, people said. That's a mirror neuron. That's why we understand each other because we recreated what we see. Anyway, so that is the second point. Uh, the planet, uh, people, then the prosperity. We have to look for new ways of prosperity, I guess. And that is um, something which um, is, is very, very obvious. And there are quite some attempts also. And also uh, participation, new ways of participation in which the mimetic relationship, that means a democratic relationship, accepting the, accepting the other on the same level as we are, and. Uh, exchanging and discuss things with the other person is, is essential. So in my view, uh, it is worthwhile to reconsider uh, education under this perspective of a creative Im, Im, uh, creative mimetic um, imitation of um, social behavior, of cultural behavior. And um, I think uh, in, in Ostas, Birkland's um, presentation, there were lots of situations I would discover what I was talking about in a more theoretical way. Okay, I think is it now? Uh, so I would say, um, re let's reconsider the, the role of mimetic learning as a complex learning uh, and a creative learning and get rid of that notion that this is not, uh, it's just a copying process. No, it is the way I develop and this rediscovered, then this is a very creative process and very essential for learning. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Herr Wolf. Uh, actually, as far as I know, you have already developed this word, mimesis, since 1990s. It was very yeah. in your early <laughs> actually career, career. And this uh, mimetic learning has been very popularized in the Western cultures. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's uh, after this, uh, well, after this report, I inspired a lot from what you have said. For example, you, um, you remind us that the 
uh, the human being um, were living in a totally different world uh, from what we previous imagined. So we need to re, uh, uh, how to say, re, uh, try to rephrase our human yeah. beings in our educational field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, nowadays we talk not about the technology. And actually just now we have a, a lecture on the AI education and mm -hmm. the professor Miller have a, um, have a uh, idea that this talk about AI education is not that new in educational field because we have already have this discussion on the television education, the online ma mass education, which might be a benefit or transform the educational field. But the thing is, we need to think about this is just a tool, but not the end of the education. So I guess when you talk about this transformation of the, the uh, hum, understand the human being now, it means that we need, we need to bind to the human being itself to understand what human being it is. It's not only from the technology point, but yeah. also from the yeah. inside out. Yeah, yeah, so this is the first well, point that I inspired by your talk. And the yeah. second is that when you talk about the mimetic learning, actually in China, we have a long tradition of mimetic learning. We always that Confucius is the mm -hmm. idol yeah. of a teacher. So yeah. we mimetic, we imitate how the Confucius mm -hmm. said. And in the school yeah. field, we talk about the mimetic learning quite a lot. But the thing is, you give, you, you uh, rephrase these words in a different mm -hmm. way. In the previous yeah. words or in previous educational theory, we always uh, think that mimetic learning is a very lacking uh, practice in education. We try mm -hmm. to avoid this term. We yeah. try to uh, yeah. forbidden the children to mimetic yeah. it from the teachers. But they, indeed, when we back to the educational field, this is the essential and this is the basis of learning. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't create uh, these yeah. things. We can't create AIDS, the so-called individual. So I guess your talk remind us that we should back to the human being and also back to the essential of education as a mim mimetic learning. The yeah. thing is, how can we understand the mimetic in our right way? Now, I have a question for you. The first me, is... Yeah, okay, let me just answer a little bit to yeah, what you say. <clears throat> that, yeah. that, <clears throat> that exactly is the point. Mimetic learning is a complex learning. You know, it is an, lots of our learning is unconsciously. We are not aware of what we learn. We see people behave and we adapt to that. And I think we have to be rediscover the importance of uh, mimetic processes for learning as we rediscovered some decades ago the importance of the body <clears throat> and, the, and uh, the senses and the emotions in education. If we do not deal with a more complex way, we also will not create complex and uh, <laughs> people and youngsters. They, yeah. you know, it depends how we relate to them. And, yeah, okay, anyway, yeah. so it was just a remark, but I fully agree with what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes people want to create new terms to rephrase the education, but actually sometimes we need also to rediscover the old terms, <laughs> make yeah. it has new meaning. Yeah. So well, I, I my, found it, yeah. In my last book, I had, have a chapter on, on Confucianism, <clears throat> and uh, there the accent is more on the let's say, on the conservative uh, mm. uh, part of, of, of mimesis, whereas I'm putting the accent more on the innovative side of it. But conservative yeah. today is, in, uh, uh, is very important because we have to conserve our nature. We have to conserve this planet because we, for a long time, we were in the process of destroying it. So yeah. conservation <laughs> becomes a, uh, gets a new di dimension. And... I think you can discover some of it in, in, in uh, Confucius. Of course, there are differences to our modern uh, concepts of, of education or of individuality and so on. But still, I think it's a very valuable uh, dimension which he is uh, referring to in many aspects. Yeah. Okay, now. <laughs> Yeah, but back to the words of con uh, con conservation, because um, you know, um, as you you said, mimetic learning should be creative, like in the art field. Yeah. 
yeah, if someone wants to be expertise, they need to imitate different types of pictures or different type, types of picture uh, pieces of art. So in this art uh, field, if someone imitates other pieces, other masterpieces, they might be, you know, this mimetic learning, we can say it's creative uh, process. Yeah. But the thing is, when we back to the educational field, if we required uh, the students to imitate or mimesis what the ancient has said yeah. or yeah. already write it down and asking them to uh, follow that, then it yeah. become the mm -hmm. reproduction and restrain the imagination. So I'm yeah. confused. Uh, yeah. Obviously, they were, mm -hmm. they were all mimetic learnings, but why the result is so different? What determined the difference in hand? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a very good <clears throat> question. <clears throat> My point is that, um, that the you cannot avoid mimetic learning. The question mm -hmm. is if you do it consciously and if you use the anthropological potential of mimetic learning. And my argument is that uh, it, it, very often this kind of learning has been devaluated because people think it's just a copy machine. This is not true. If you give time to people and if you have to children, they will, through a mimetic process, make what they learn part of their imaginary, of their emotion. They will digest it. Of, of, and that is the basis also for creative learning. It is not that, uh, you know, sub superficially uh, reproducible learning uh, helps you to become creative. No, you have to get into the things. And you mm. do this in a mimetic process. For a novel, for example, you know, you have to recreate it, that, that the novel lives in you. And then it may also have an influence on your education, on the way you look at the world and so on. Whereas if you just learn the, the content, <laughs> then it's in, you know, it doesn't pay. Then you can read a, a, a summary. It is this yeah. kind of really working with the world with the cultural world, with the natural world, and adopting it and making it part of you. And this is my view is, uh, uh, is the importance of, of mimetic uh, learning. And this adds a dimension, which we are, we have forgotten, but put it that way. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this, no this might be what you just refer to aesthetic mimetic, mimetic yeah. learning. But in the educational field, we usually don't have so much time to let children to dig into the, the things, dig into this imitation process. We just learn the issue profession. This is one of the things we need to uh, take in consider. Yeah, thank you. So that means the time works. We need to slow down rather than accelerate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, in the educational field. So back to the mimetic learning, you will re refer that body should be considered as a very, <laughs> a very important uh, medium or uh, in the mimetic process. Actually, I found in Western countries or in Western academic field, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the the economy between the mind and body uh, is very sharp. But in China, the body has been conceptualized as a, a holistic. Uh, it is very different from the Western uh, traditions, uh, which might uh, endow the body as a very negative uh, um, term. But in Chinese ancient text, there have been a very strong refers to body as way of thinking. That means mm -hmm. the human being has been considered as the most basic point of departure from the meaningful list. Mm -hmm. uh, some classic words also read, the classic uh, uh, also said that traditional Chinese philosophers start from the body from the very beginning. Uh, an actual uh, exit sense of how body has been conceived in early China can be found in different philosopher <laughs> fake schools, such as the Taoism and also Confucianism. So mm -hmm. these two schools, they, they treat the body not only as an object that one has, but rather that yeah. associate body with the process of unfolding. This is something is doing and done in ancient Chinese. So such but, but there is a, another important thing arose that in ancient China, when we talk about 
about the body, we often refer the body or associate the body with the patterns of family, self, and cultivated state. Mm -hmm. For example, we, we in Chinese talk, in Chinese mm -hmm. language, we say that yeah. one's body, hair, skin are gifts from the parents. Mm -hmm. So that means probably for you, body is, um, um, you know, is talk mm -hmm. about oneself, about the individual. But in Chinese context, when we talk about it, a body, we return to the collective in images. But it's, mm -hmm. it, it is kind of extension of this one's parents, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, it's not only back to the individual itself, but uh, back to the connective body. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering in the mimetic process, how can we deal with this connective body and the body as a self? Yeah, you want me to answer? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Okay, there are two perspectives. One is uh, that we look at the body from inside. It's something which is living, you know, which is, uh, which actually helps us to relate to the world. And we are part of it. We are part of nature by the fact that we have a body. But the difference is that this body is culturally um, influenced and shaped already before we, we are born, you know, already in the, in the room of our mother, the way she, what she eats, the way she behaves, the way uh, the experience she has has an influence on it. So this is the uh, the attempt to look at the body not just as an instrument, as it is often done for work or for whatever, but look at it in a more sensitive way, um, understanding the movements, and the, the the emotions and. And also the thinking, of course, and how emotions are related to thinking and so on and so on. So this concept uh, of the body is the concept of the living body. You have today in the international literature also the other concept, where it's just an instrument to fulfill certain tasks. Uh, but that's what I'm not interested in. And my, my argument is that uh, it needs much more attention to the complexity of our learning processes, which are not just uh, learning uh, concepts, but learning with the whole person, with our body, with our senses, with our emotions, um, learning ourselves uh, also in a social context. That's what children in, in, in Germany were missing, you know, when, when in the Corona period, they said, well, we are, we are, we have no friends anymore. We are lonely. And there are lots of psychological problems which come up. Human yeah. beings are, are social beings to much more than every other uh, um, primate is a social, yeah. we are social beings. Everything yeah. we, we get from the older generation in order to create it then in a new way. That is the, so to speak, the, the wisdom of education. You learn, and in the same time, you, you change things, you develop them. Yeah, anyway, I hope I got your point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, thank you very much. And I will also have a question from the audience from yeah. Haifu. Uh, he, he asked, in the future education, if you want to, uh, if, if just, we, if we want, uh, use this mimetic learning in mm -hmm. educational field, integrate this mimetic learning in uh, educational field, how can we do it? Shall we well, use it with the help of the technology or how? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it depends on the on the subject. In school, for example, it depends on the on the context, but you can say there are a few elements which are important. You have, first of all, you have to give time to the learning process, not to mm. accelerate too much, but spending time with what you learn. And then yeah. you develop also alternatives, creative interpretation, creative views of, of what you have, uh, what you are uh, learning. And this is important. You know, we want, you know, it is, it's an error to think that we can prepare the, the young generation today in terms of content for the future. We have to provide them also with the ability to cope with new problems, with insecurity, with new questions. And in order to provide this kind of attitude, we need a deeper exchange with the objects of the culture or of, of, of nature and whatever it is. And so my argument is, reduce 
the uh, acceleration in education and mm -hmm. concentrate on less, but do it in a, in a, in a profound way and mm -hmm. spend time. And then you create also creativity. You know, children, when you give them a task with, where you have no answer, and there are some, mm -hmm. then they will become creative and they develop their imagination. And that is what we want. We want them to be you know, creative. And uh, yeah. I think there are many possibilities. I'm just saying a few principles right now. It depends on, on the individual uh, teaching context, of course, to make, make it even uh, more precise. Yeah, as you just referred, in future education, we should not only focus on the contents, what contents we have already learned, but how can we develop the creative ability of the, the students? Yeah. Probably, as you said, sometimes the learning result is not visible. It's instead yeah. it's yeah. invisible, and the practical knowledge is one of the invisible knowledge that may maybe what the children learn in yeah. the educational field. Then the yeah. question is. Um, if in the past we focus more on the results of uh, cumulative, cumulative knowledge, then we have uh, steps, we have uh, certain instructions to um, teach how children can learn the cumulative knowledge. We start from the concept, and then we have this kind mm. of uh, uh, relationship, and we have we need to to define it. Anyway, we we have certain develop this kind of uh, teaching procedures, but how can we teach practical knowledge or it is teachable, you know, it, <laughs> portable? This cannot be the only uh, concept of education, but it is a part of it, practical knowledge. You know, having students uh, try out certain practices, that is, and then they learn by doing saying well this doesn't work so much this doesn't work but other things work or you can also create it by having uh, uh, certain situations of conflict for example you help them to to solve the problem uh, and in a, a non-violent way and this is of course uh, some, when they have learned this this is something which is valuable during the, the rest of their life and mm. what I'm arguing is also some trust into the learner. You know, they will do, they will find their way, but we have mm. to provide possibilities for them to experience with themselves and with the world. And, you know, mm. somebody, when you are more interested in what uh, I'm talking about, we just published last week the uh, handbook, the Paul Grave Handbook of Embodiment and Learning. It's an um, mm. international uh, contribution to the topic of, of the body in learning and also, of course, mimetic learning. And um, it's at, at the Paul Grave Macmillan. You have an article in it also. And we have yeah. articles from Africa, from Latin America, uh, also to show that there are different ways of learning and that the body also plays a different role in, in learning, in, in educational systems. But anyway, so if that somebody is interested, I think you can get it uh, even probably uh, you know, the university has bought the uh, Springer uh, um, program and then you can just get the book without paying. You just uh, uh, load it, do some downloading of the text. But anyway, it's just last week it came out. So. <laughs> but yeah, it, okay, it, 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 I, later on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, later on, I will send, send the links in the in the chat box and so that the audience can download yeah. or, or can check the information at least. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so have Wolf, thank you so much for the inspired okay. talk. And also thanks that, that you managed to join to us. We are so appreciate for your time and your intelligence.